Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Jams Tea Podcast, where we spin the jams and spill the tea. And today we're coming at you with two brand new reviews for two brand new records. Two big ones today. We're going to be talking about the new album from pop sensation Janelle Monet, her new album, The Age of Pleasure. And we're also going to be talking about the newest album from Jason Isbell and the 400 unit. We're talking about weather vanes. So stay tuned for that. But first, we're going to be talking about the age of pleasure. Absolutely, yes. Uh, so, we're, so Jake and I are going to be talking about the age of pleasure. And then we're going to be joined later by Morgan, of course, to talk about the new Jason Isbell album. Uh, but let's start with Janelle. Let's start with the record of the two. I mean, both of these albums, I think, have, have kind of been a little bit overshadowed by other sort of bigger, more attention-grabbing releases this week, which is a damn shame because both of these albums are from really esteemed, really established artists that are doing something particularly interesting with their whole shtick this time around. And especially in the case of Janelle, who's definitely changing things up in a more bold way. So Janelle Monet, for anyone who doesn't know, I mean, I'm sure that most people who are watching this do know, but Janelle Monet came up in the late 2000s and through the 2010s as a kind of an artist that came to define, I guess, what I would like to call progressive R&B to a certain extent, like just sort of taking some of the movement in R&B from the 90s and 2000s and taking it into a kind of more... I guess ambitious sphere both in terms of like the sonic incorporations of the genre and also the kind of conceptual possibilities of how you could basically combine the sounds of modern R&B and the kind of conceptual nature of like frog music in terms of like album construction and that really basically came to a head with first of all her debut EP the uh, Metropolis Suite One which was the prelude to her debut album, The Arch Android, which was a an absolute sensation when it released in 2010 and a hugely sort of conceptually ambitious record that basically announced Janelle's presence in an incredibly bold and, you know, exciting way. I mean, that was an incredibly acclaimed album, uh, one of the most acclaimed albums of the entire 2010s, in fact, and really announced and put Janelle forward as a, an incredibly forward-thinking, progressive and conceptually ambitious artist, as well as just a, an incredibly dynamic and powerful performer with an insane voice. Janelle was really the whole package. And that continued with Janelle's follow-up album, 2013's The Electric Lady, which was another example of, of a kind of sprawling, ambitious, conceptual record, heavily influenced by Prince. And then Janelle took a bit of time off uh, before coming back slightly reinvented with 2018's Dirty Computer, which still had its own kind of conceptual structure to it, but lacked the kind of sprawl of those first two albums and was a much more kind of refined, almost sort of straightforward R&B pop album that simultaneously reined in some of those ambitions on the scale of like album construction, but also put Janelle forward as pulling from more influences than ever before. So Janelle retained that sense of, of inventiveness, that sense of dynamism, that sense of creativity with Dirty Computer. And that was one of 2018's most listened to, most talked about, and most celebrated albums. Uh, but it's been five years since then. Janelle's forays into cinema have been more and more successful as time's going on as well. She's proven herself to be an incredibly multifaceted and super talented uh, artist and person in her own right of course and not that that was un ever under question but she's just continued to expand her repertoire and all the while fans of Janelle's music fans like myself and Jake have been itching for her to return to that format and finally we have that with the age of pleasure which is as you might have expected from Janelle kind of another reinvention of sorts another refinement of sorts and a particular pivot into a direction that was sort of signaled with certain elements of the themes of Dirty Computer. I mean, one of the things that came through on that record more so than any records before was Janelle's upfrontness about her sexuality, about her queerness, about her discovery of herself in ever expanding ways as she's growing older and about her increasing comfort with incorporating that into her art. And indeed, in many parts, like in some of the pre-release singles for Dirty Computer, making that sexual element the kind of front and center focus. And so Janelle's sort of sexual pride and sexual self-discovery and sexual confidence uh, has come forth more and more and more in her art as 
with each record that's come out. And so it's not all that surprising that that sexuality, that that sense of self-confidence, that that sense of self-love, and that that sort of carefree embrace of hedonism is the core focus of this new album. And my God, this album is delightful. This album is an absolute confection, a total celebration of Janelle's confidence, of Janelle's just unshakable swagger, and of her desire to, at all costs and with no capitulation, have a completely fucking good time. And get the listener to have a really, really good time as well. You know, there's two sides to this new album. Well, there's two kind of upshots to this new album. One is that it is by far the least dynamic Janelle Monet record, which is not to say that it isn't dynamic at all. In fact, there is subtle but very pointed genre fusions that happen throughout this record that really make it stand out and have a lot of, I think, uh, underlying meaning in terms of like cultural and sexual statements. But it is less freeform than her previous records. It is less kind of pulling from all sorts of influences and kind of doing different things on a song to song basis. It's less sort of scattershot. It is more honed into a particular focus, which is admittedly more narrow. And the narrowness of this focus, I guess, combined with people perhaps wanting something a little bit more arch, something a little bit more out there, I suppose, from Janelle, given what they basically came to her for initially, has led a little bit of the reception to this album to be a bit frostier than her previous records. Again, it depends on where you look. Some people are, uh, critically, it's been pretty well received, but you know there are some people who are definitely sort of not fully on board with this new direction for Janelle. So it's a divisive album. And going into it, I was weary of that divisiveness but i have to say you know prefacing my deeper thoughts i have had a fucking ball listening to this album this week this is this thing is definitely carefree this thing is definitely shed itself of a lot of the deeper and more sort of i don't know nuanced sort of structural concerns of her previous records that feels like a poor way of putting that but hopefully you get what i mean if you've heard them and it is simply just about having a fucking party but there's a little bit a little bit more to it than that. And there's a little bit of, uh, again, there's a little bit of depth and creativity to the way in which she executes that that we all get into. But Jake, um, talk us through a little bit how you came to be a fan of Janelle, what your sort of hopes or expectations were for this new album and what you think of it now that it's here and now that you've had a chance to live with it for a bit. Well, I became a fan of Janelle's when Dirty Computer came out and I listened to that album. It was just like, Damn this person they've got some surprisingly i i didn't really get to, around to the arc android until the beginning of this year uh but i love that album it's a really really terrific really conceptual kind of blend of r&b and art pop and you get like this amazing mix of genuine sort of afro futurist atmosphere and just straightforward pop bangers uh and the same can be said for uh her next two albums and that they they blend a very distinct flavor of art pop and something a little bit beyond that uh you compared uh electric lady to uh prince who actually does show up on that album and i feel like janelle catches a lot of prince comps in terms of like her overall artistic oeuvre and just similarities and eccentricities are highly comparable uh to that of prince and very true uh in that that is a hundred percent on the money and i would like to propose that the age of pleasure here is janelle's dirty mind uh in that it is shorter it is more succinct it is hornier and it kind of issues a lot of the critical conventions that made a lot of this artist's more major works maybe hit as hard as they did with critics with audiences with whatever and look i understand this album being a bit of a tough sell because it is a pivot for Janelle. It is a pivot in terms of what uh, she's done in the past. It's very different. There's stuff on this album. There's, you know, Afrobeat, reggae, dance hall, like, and no notably, she's also rapping a hell of a lot more than she usually does. Uh, not to say that it's like something that's completely new or anything. Hell, Outkast were some of the artists that brought her up in the first place. There is kind of a um, 
Andre 3000 to all of this in some of the performances I find. She's very light on her feet on this album. And that is 100% the appeal of all of it. I really love that we have a lower stakes project from Janelle, just because I feel like that's a courtesy we as fans of her haven't really been afforded yet. She's always had to go all out. You know, like she's never been a pop star that's been as successful as maybe some of her contemporaries or some people that maybe she's compared alongside. And so I feel like she's maybe, whenever she's put out an album, it's had to be this huge conceptual blowout. Like, you know, she's got to throw all the bells and whistles in, you know, do everything, put everything into it. And that's what makes her releases so momentous. So paradoxically, this comes out and it's just kind of like, this feels very much like a, almost like a stopgap released for another artist. But because she embraces the individuality of this album, it feels so refreshing and confident and breezy. It's a ideal summer album from the album cover and aesthetic to it all to, again, that kind of pop reggae vibe that a lot of the songs on here have. And honestly, a lot of my issues with the album really stem down to not even structure, but I guess it's its brevity is both its biggest strength and its biggest weakness. She revels in a lot of different sounds, and I love all of them. I love how constantly rhythmic and percussive this album is. The bass on here is constantly fat and kicking and fun. The grooves on this album are just, again, they're a delight. They're super fun. The back half of this album genuinely has some of the best songs that I feel like Janelle has put out. Uh, lead single for this album, Lipstick Lover, has grown on me exponentially. I thought it was really fun when it came out. And now, this song is a fucking jam. I love this. Water Slide, I think, is even better. This song has some of the best flows that she has ever brought out. And then there's stuff like No Better, or Only Have Eyes for Two. This kind of stuff is exactly what I want when I think of Janelle Monet makes a summer horny ass album. The thing is, though, is that a lot of these sounds that she's reveling in, I get the idea of making this a little bit more breezy, low stakes affair. But I always feel like when I'm done with this album is that I'm like, I just want more you know like i feel like if you know maybe you added some of the meat on the bones of some of these songs that it would feel a little bit more inherently robust for the most part a lot of the scanter stuff on here really fits into the interlocking structure in a way that you don't even first notice when you listen to the album like there are some sort of songs on here that'll be playing and you're just like oh this is basically an extended outro of the previous song or or an extended intro to the next song. This sort of seamless flow of the album makes this experience feel all the more flowing and even grand to some extent. And I feel like if maybe she indulged in these moments just a little bit more in a very sort of uncharacteristic critique of mine is that I just kind of wish that some elements here felt like they were a little bit more substantial. Again, we haven't been afforded the luxury of listening to Janelle kind of cut loose yet. And that's where I think a lot of this album's identity feels really valuable when it comes to the context of her overall discography. Yeah, I mean, you described it as a great summer album, and it is. And what's just one of the things that I think has been a part of why it's resonated with me so much is that it's a fucking freezing cold winter where I am. And we've had a lot of great mm -hmm. albums that have like coincidentally come out in the northern uh, hemisphere of summer. But this was like a real pick in the ass, like just to get something that's this kind of vivacious and just this kind of lively that has, I guess, kind of pushed me to realize that I needed this even though I, I didn't think I needed this. Like, it's, it's something that <laughs> Janelle knows I need more than I know that I need. And it's 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 been a really kind of like, just, it, it's invigorated me in a, in a really dour and depressing season. I mean, I'm so, someone that often suffers from seasonal depression as well. So like, this has invigorated me in a hugely unexpected way. Um, so that's on a personal note, but just sort of going back to what, to what Janelle's doing. I mean, you're right. So Janelle came out as non-binary last year as well. That was a huge uh, moment for them. So that obviously kind of foregrounded this preoccupation with identity as it relates to sexuality for going into this and sort of feeling like, okay, well, that's always kind of been a theme in Janelle's music or particularly with Dirty Computer. So we can expect that to come to the fore more here. 
And yeah, yeah, I just can't get past what a what a glorious celebration this entire thing feels like and, and how it plays. I, I think that um I, I don't share your structural con- not concerns. I don't share your structural limits with this album. I think that it flows beautifully. I will say it is certainly on the more brief side. So there's this feeling of like it kind of maybe really only having the material for a, a shorter release, like an EP possibly, but at the same time. When this is over, I don't, I don't know, I don't want this to sound um, mean or anything, but when this is over, I don't want more of it. I don't wish that it had kept going. It, it kind of is the perfect length, but it, it, it and it's, and it's, and, and its pace and its focus on sort of living in the moment and being inside a very simple, very hedonistic pleasure. Like it, it, it knows that the the core themes of this album the core things that janelle is celebrating the core sort of energies and vibes that she's tapping into are very simple are very direct they, they're not complicated things they're not complicated feelings it is feeling yourself it is loving yourself it is feeling hot it is feeling sexy it, it is wanting hot. to indulge in the in, in whatever essentially feels natural coming out of those primal instantaneous feelings of self-love and self-discovery so it's a record with very narrow concerns and it doesn't out overstretch itself it doesn't pad itself out or become redundant in its exploration of these ideas i think it would if it were a stretch to a longer length uh, just because of the nature of what it is i mean if janelle could go fully into the kind of identity and sexuality exploration pathway and i'm sure write a, a massive sort of double album opus exploring that but in seeking to kind of focus and hone it down to these very simple feelings these very simple expressions i think janelle uh, she creates something that has this just vivacious primacy to it this immediacy to it this kick to it this absolutely you get the sense of, of the pulse of her ecstasy and her joy coming through in this and that's something that makes it feel so on the moment and and so like instantaneous and so just captivating instantly it's not a record that you kind of well i I guess to some extent i warmed to this record the more that i listened to it but there is a sense with which you can understand it fairly quickly and it really comes down how much you enjoy it really comes down to how satisfying you find the simplicity of its aims that said for as simplistic as the aims of this album are thematically there is a complexity and there is a nuance to the way that it is musically constructed. I mean, you have so many different musical traditions that are essentially being collided together. You know, of course, musical traditions that have a huge history of blackness, obviously, you've got Afrobeat, you've got reggae, and you've got trap music. I mean, these three different core, heavily black forms of musical expression that come from various different diasporas that are collided into this album, into this kind of just massive melting pot essentially and and the the slickness and the ease and the naturalness with which these things are collided with which these things are mounted together particularly on a song like float which is the kind of the mission statement that musically puts all this stuff together from the jump so you instantly know here's what janelle is doing and one of the most sort of baller ways that she does this is by collaborating with and forgive me if i pronounce the name wrong sun kuti who is the son of the legendary afrobeat legend Bella Kuti. and bring who now fronts Fela Kuti's band Egypt 80 and essentially the the horn collaborations that kind of um contra- the, those, those sorts of contributions that you would expect come through across this album from Sun and the band and it is it, honestly such a fucking power move to get the son of Fela Kuti on this album kind of forming the bedrock of so many of these songs and I mean, Float as a mission statement is just, it, it really captures the sense of freedom and relief and escape that comes from being able to embrace your sexuality when it when it differs from the norm and when you've kind of been boxed in for so long and you're able to just completely relinquish those constraints. It's euphoric. Yeah, it is. It's, it's not that it's a particularly novel or new theme to be explored in popular music recently, but Janelle's expression of it is just... This is an album that I cannot listen to without fucking grooving. If I'm in my room, if I'm on my own, I'm dancing to this shit. I'm feeling this shit. If you aren't moving, you're doing it wrong, frankly. Absolutely. It's just beautiful, perfect self-contained opening statement. And then just 
while this album is like it, obviously so much shorter and obviously so much more contained and, and less sprawling than her previous records, she does reincorporate the idea of sweets throughout this album. I mean, the run from champagne shit through to hot, well, essentially, even through ooh la la, it looks, I mean, there's this sense with which the whole thing flows basically like a sweet. I mean, float itself is very yeah. contained, but once champagne shit comes in, flows right into Black Sugar Beach, which is an outro essentially, but also works to just seamlessly connect the two ideas of champagne shit and phenomenal. And then Hope brings this kind of baseline in or this kind of like groove in that kind of is not the same as champagne shit, but it echoes champagne shit and you get this yeah. continuity that's coming through that entire section. Then seamlessly weaving into the next part of the album with a fucking Grace Jones feature in French. <laughs> Such a, again, there's these little things that she Flex. does that, that are just so baller, exactly. And Lipstick Lover as well, which, as you mentioned, was the lead single, the most kind of overtly sort of reggaeton, sort of really kind of leaning in that groove on the entire record. And it's just, it's, it's just fantastic. Fucking drums. Oh. Uh, yeah, exactly. The, again, it's that fusion. It's that that fusion of Afrobeat with trap and with kind of with modern drum sounds, with modern uh, percussion and and sort of traditional percussion that makes there, it so dynamic. There's even like uh, there's even like a Shibuya Kai to some of these Ooh. songs on here. Like you, you can really feel that strongly. And yeah. like as somebody who's like gotten a little bit more into that kind of music, I was just like, ah. I see you. I see you, Janelle. Well, it, it's like, it, it's great because it, it, it's a little moment where you get to kind of recognize how the these various different genres and movements from various different countries kind of expand out from one another. Because Shibuya Kai is, of course, inspired by ska, which itself comes back to various forms of, of African musical expression and Afrobeat, all these different kinds of things. So there's this sense with which there's this continuity and there's this sort of recognition of the various diaspora and the various different um, ways in which these traditions have manifested over the years as they've been translated and evolved and changed and mixed with all these different things. It, it really is like, it's, you know, obviously on one level, it's also a kind of celebration of blackness. It's a celebration of cultural identity, but even more than that, Janelle, I think, pulls a thread between the kind of fluidity of her gender expression and the kind of interconnectedness of the various different kind of cultural touchstones and points that she draws from right she sees uh fluidity in identity with in terms of gender and she recognizes a kind of underlying affinity between that and the kind of fluidity of culture that music is basically at its core <laughs> basically all music we talk about in some way is a kind of culturally fluid mixture of things basically and janelle you know it's, it's subtext on the record but i think janelle is kind of pulling together those ideas i absolutely I I love those blaring horns. Those blaring horns throughout the record, and the the way in which they collide with the trap influence is fantastic. The champagne shit is just ah, oh, it's just such a so much fun major. I've had I'll be your lottery at night just going in my head the whole time with that sort of groovy little you know pitched up bass line is just mm, that's. This this whole time you've been talking, like I've been half listening and half trying to force the hook from float out of my head. Float on, Absolutely. float on, float. Well, and the album just has is just layered and stacked with all with you know, unforgettable and very hooky moments like that. I mean, phenomenal. I turn into the most like fucking most like tr like cliche stereotypical queer motherfucker when i'm listening to the song it is impossible if you're in a seat if that moves or if you're just somewhere where you can kind of move around it's impossible not to just kind of vogue while you're listening to the song <laughs> just fucking strike a pose and lip sync strike a pose. each fucking delivery of how you feel phenomenal it's just it's it's, <laughs> it's so, so much fun it's so much fun and and there's a little bit of madonna in the in the energy of that song as well oh Definitely. There's definitely. a lot of, I think, obviously, we've already talked about Prince, but I think that Janelle in general draws a lot from the 80s in her music. Madonna and Janet are all over this album. Oh, absolutely. And she does a great job of, again, modernizing that and making that fit into her wheelhouse. Again, there's always a slick, tidy bass line, as you mentioned. It just feels like a party. Mm -hmm. And I, again, the features here are well deployed as well. I'm not familiar with the featured artist, Doichi, but her presence yeah, me either. is uh, particularly... Memorable. There's just this great moment that always makes me laugh every time I listen to the album, which is like, 
Phenomenal pose. Phenomenal kush. Beautiful gowns. Phenomenal purse. Like, she, she just... Redundant <laughs> repetition. Phenomenal purse that just completely seems... She knows what's important. Like, yeah. That, and I just... I love that. I mean, yeah, it's a fucking horny album. It, that comes through so much. There's the simultaneous energy of like just unrepentant horniness and a need to kind of express that sexual energy. And also a sense of like camaraderie and celebration for how shared that is in this environment, right? And and that sense of humor as well comes through in hot as well. Like again, flowing perfectly out of phenomenal. And I'm just like, I look hot. <laughs> like the way she says that is just, <laughs> It's so fucking funny, man. I love that. Uh, we already talked about Lipstick Lover, but the, the fucking The Rush. Oh, my God. I want yeah. the rush. Oh, I want the rush. I want the rush. I want the rush. Uh, my, my critical faculties are melting before your eyes right now as I just think about how just sublime the experience is. And you've mentioned Water Slide, which is like, you know, album has so many great hooks. This is the one. Best. I, in my head the most just the facts bro freestyle on the thing like it's high time like look there's a long tradition of songs about masturbation of songs about sort of sexual expression that use a really kind of obvious metaphor i mean janelle even has songs like that on dirty computer and there's a yep. lot of history and tradition of me- <laughs> of using water in some way or or water sports let's just say and so oh, no poor choice of words as a kind of like uh an obvious bit of innuendo right and it's obvious the whole song is about masturbation and you know hinting at you know the different ways in which you can kind of to quote kendrick lamar's feature on that first scissor album pussy <laughs> Of the, the, you get immediately what water slide is it's so obvious but it only makes it more gleeful to just listen to janelle kind of do those basic obvious innuendos and twist them into her own thing i mean it gets so on the nose that at the very end of the album it's literally just her going stroke 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 <laughs> like, like like it's some kind of yeah it's thank uh, you janelle she 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 <laughs> janelle's delivering i uh, think no better is Oh, the fucking move on No Better, those fucking double time bass drum kicks, those fucking horns that are just like almost constantly pushing the groove forward. And again, the pocket that Janelle fits into it in this song, it's just remarkable, it's irresistible. And again, you can't not move to it. I will say, look, it's a, re- it's a very fun album. It's uh, consistently very, very enjoyable. I do find i do get a little bit less out of the final three tracks than everything else up to this point again they're not a, it's not a drop off by any means but there is a little bit less of a i don't know it's not that there's less of a, of a fully realized idea here either because that's not right either it's just that it's it's a little bit it becomes a little bit redundant with paid and pleasure which is nice but slight and then only have eyes for two which is probably the best of the last three tracks i mean okay yeah it's my favorite in cheek, very princey song about threesomes, and you know it, it's fine. I, I don't mind it. It's just not one of my favorites. And a dry read is like there's a beautiful flamenco guitar in, in the mm-hmm. track that I love. It's got this kind of you know very sort of peaceful energy that lulls you down into the final uh, closing moments of the record. And obviously, it's about you know there's an obvious metaphor here. Well, not metaphor, but there's an obvious bit of like wordplay here between sexual noises and wine and so but it doesn't quite work for me because when she says wine for me you know trying obviously to play into both of those readings of the word wine like wine is not a sexual word for me like wine is like what someone who's complaining uh and and so i don't think it quite works uh baby won't you wine for me just in my head i'm i'm thinking about you know someone someone at work who's just complaining about something for the sake of being annoying. Look, if Janelle Monet asked me to whine, I'd say how high-pitched. Yeah, well, that's true. I mean, look, it's not as if she's playing coy for the whole song when she literally when she literally sings, me and you can just fuck in that jacuzzi and make a scene. You know, she's not 
she's being coy and she's using those under windows, but it only goes up to a point. But look, it's a beautiful ending to the album. So yeah, while I definitely think, you know, it, it's a little bit slight by design, I do feel as though if it were padded out or even if it were kind of expanded in a more thoughtful way, there would be something of the in and out just brevity and hit of it that would be a little bit lost in that. I think maybe people are to some degree also a little bit underwhelmed just because of its length and the fact that it's the first thing we've heard from Janelle in five years. Yeah, in five years. And have that kind of weight, it creates that sense of, of expectation that I don't think is fair on Janelle. And I don't really know. That, no. I don't really know that there's a way around it. But um, but look, I, I, I think I it to be really entertaining, really enjoyable and really euphoric. And I'm so glad that Janelle made it and committed to it. And I'm so glad that she's been so like OTT and how she's like promoted it and and really put forward that just boisterous, bold, I dare you to be, a, I dare you to be prudish. I dare you to be kind of offended by my expression uh, and the way that she's, you know, presented this. I, I think- mean, there's that video of her on Twitter of her opening the vinyl for the album. And it's just like, boobs right there it's just like she's just like if i can't have them on the cover then i'm gonna put them in the centerfold of the vinyl god damn it dirty computer was an album that was like i really feel like that was her conscious attempt to kind of usurp a sort of pop star status that she had always been aiming for and it's kind of succeeded because that album was very successful and I still hear songs from it to this day, but at the same time, it still wasn't big enough to the point where, you know, Janelle Monet is quite a household name. Like you get Brian Wilson to feature on your album to make vocal harmonies. That is you making a conscious attempt to be like, I am making a fucking statement with this album. And I feel like the sort of the the fact that that album didn't maybe become the world conquering force that perhaps it should have, because it is a great album, has probably led Janelle to be like, you know, maybe I should embrace aspects of my music, aspects of my identity, aspects of my sexuality that are a bit more niche. Maybe I shouldn't play to the biggest crowd possible and just do what interests me and what makes me happy and what makes me cool. And that kind of confidence, that kind of euphoria is what this album is built out of. Mm, Absolutely. All right. Well, let's do our favorite tracks and ratings for The Age of Pleasure. Jake, why don't you go first? Easy picks here with me. Lipstick Lover, a phenomenal pop song up there with some of her best. Uh, Water Slide, same thing. And no better. Uh, seven out of ten. I enjoy this album a lot. Fantastic. My three favorite tracks are Float, Water Slide, and No Better. But I also kind of just want to put Champagne Shit all the way through to Hot in as one thing and put that there too. Mm-hmm. I adore this album. I'm giving it a 7.5, which gives us an average overall for Janelle Monet's The Age of Pleasure of 7.2. All right. We are now joined by Morgan, and it is time to review an album that we have all been very, very excited to discuss. That being the new album from Jason Isbell and the 400 unit Weather Veins. Now, longtime subscribers to the channel or anyone who cares enough to have been invested in the narrative of how this show has progressed might remember or just know that the last Jason Isbell record proper of original material, not counting Georgia Blue, the last Jason Isbell and the 400 Unit album, Reunions, was one of the first albums that we ever talked about in Jams and Tea in the very second episode of the show proper. And it was an album that we all broadly enjoyed. Well, all three of us... I mean, August does an impression of Jason Isbell that sounds like Scott Stapp. Yeah, that's right. He does. What does he do? What about that? What about that? Hell... (laughs) <laughs> it's anyway we we which, were young which was an album that the three of us all sitting here all enjoyed to varying degrees although i don't think any of us felt that it was one of jason's strongest works it was still you know it was another great entry into the canon of an artist who's who had established up to that point a an almost impenetrable run of music and and one of the most essential voices in country music and americana and whatever box you want to put him in essentially and Reunions, of course, was an album that we consumed in the middle of the event 
of 2020, which shall remain nameless because if I named it, it would cause us to be demonetized. And we consumed it within that context as well. But of course, it was recorded before that event took place. And, you know, it's quite notable as well. Looking back on reunions, I, I re-listened to it two weeks ago, coinciding with finally watching the HBO documentary, Jason Isbell Running With Our Eyes Closed, which documented the recording of that album, which was an incredibly illuminating documentary. And, you know, reflecting on that record, there are still, that, that record still really stands out as uh, simultaneously like a step forward for Jason, but also containing some material that feels maybe a little bit less essential and less of an advancement than the best stuff on that album. So that album's in a bit of a weird position where it's like got some really great material on it and some really strong material that doesn't quite hold up in the same way that the three albums prior to it just consistently hit it out of the park. And, you know, we recently talked about Southeastern, the breakthrough solo Isbell record in our Record Club series, which obviously turned 10 recently. And there is a sense with which the legacy of that album hangs over Isbell to this day as well, with the titular Weather Vane on the album cover, obviously providing a very overt reference to that album title. So all of that said, what is Weather Vane's in the context of Isbell's career? What is Weather Vane's in the context of this incredible run that Jason has been on that has captivated us and that has led to some of our most passionate musical discussion on the show. And, you know, it's interesting. I was just talking about Jake, talking with Jake about this before we started recording that this is the first and Morgan, you can correct me on this. If I get this wrong, I believe this is the first album within the run since Southeastern where everyone kind of generally agrees. Jason fully came into his own to not be produced by regular collaborator, Dave Cobb. In fact, this album is self-produced, which is a really interesting decision that yields a, a noticeable shift in, it's not a huge thing, but a noticeable shift in Jason's approach to the general musical construction of this album, in tandem with the fact that this is maybe his most sweeping, ambitious product yet. Now, Morgan, I think it's only fair that you as the Isbell the Isbell Enjoyer, TM. The Isbellian. I want to throw over to you at this point. Again, following Isbell for as long as you have, did you have any kind of expectations for what this album might be? What were your kind of thoughts in the run up to it? And just an overview as well of, of what this album is, how it compares to his most recent work, and how you feel about it. Pretty much any expectation only came into fruition when the first single and first track on the album, Death Wish, came out which chronicles the story of someone who is essentially living with a partner with some pretty severe mental illness issues. It's among his most sort of sweeping and grand and ambitious songs, and it's just as soul-obliterating as so many of his best songs. Needless to say... This was firmly at the top of my most anticipated releases of the year. There's a sort of urgency and sadness that only showed up in Gantt moments on something like uh, Reunions or the Nashville Sound. I think of Overseas or Cumberland Gap that sort of have this, this overwhelming sadness to them, but uh, a real instrumental muscle and kick to them that bring their stories so much closer to home. You know, a string arrangement is not something Isabel is new to. I mean, you just look at children of children, but the string arrangement that comes in at the end of this song is just, you, you, you gotta hear it. And following this next single was Middle of the Morning, which a much more instrumentally uh, lighthearted affair but the subject matter of the song itself, it's very much in keeping with the sentiments expressed in Death Wish. Learning to live with someone who is not well, and especially sort of when you're not well yourself, it's more sort of laid back, traditional country tone. It, it, it's an encasing for a continuation of a story that's really just difficult the last single, the week or week and a half or so before the album came out, uh, Save the World, is very much a reaction to uh, 
you know, the state of the country as it pertains to gun violence and particularly the fears that Jason feels in bringing up a daughter in this world where this thing keeps happening, not even in schools, but at grocery stores and pretty much anywhere that people gather publicly. And I think in terms of a core uniting theme on basically every song on this album, it's, I think it can be summed up in sort of like, like, I don't have the answers to this. There's a sort of hopeless, well, not hopeless, but a helplessness to so much of this album. It, it's a sort of emotional tangibility that I think hasn't really been uh, seen, at least in a unified form on either the Nashville Sound or Reunions. And I think that's why this is the best album of his since Something More Than Free. I think overall, this is one of the five best new releases we've reviewed on this show. I, I'm st- Obviously, I'm still unpacking it. The thing's an hour long, and I think by some margin, his most ambitious work. But to say that this thing f- floored me, I mean, it's this is a moment in terms of releases lately. I think to sort of start in a, in a general place, that will help us to kind of, I think, unpack these songs individually, each of which is enormously hard hitting um, Uh in varying degrees and in unique ways, but in ways that are very connective and that feel very of, that they draw from a well that Jason has drawn from before. Um, And I I don't want to say that this is like particularly pointed in a new way for Jason or that he's sort of somehow kind of untapped or tapped into something kind of, that's allowed him to be you know better or or different i don't know this is very much a recognizable jason isbell record both sonically and in terms of the songwriting but there is a there's an additional this just cuts me and and cuts through me in a way that knowing what i know about jason's records and as prepared as i was still leveled me and i think part of its ability to do that comes to what I perceive to be the overarching theme of this album, which is trying to reach out to someone else. Basically, every song on this album is about trying to reach out to someone else, either because you think they need help or you're not sure if they need help or because you need help. And it is about trying to forge a connection with another person or trying to reforge or rekindle or reflect on a connection you have it's not one of the most one of the songs that jumps out the most i guess when you think of the record on the whole and some of the really you know stunning narratives that jason taps into but the first song on this album to make me cry and in many have since on subsequent listens but the first song that for some reason completely unraveled me is if you insist which is kind of the heart song. of the album in some ways you know you could it is a very simple story of, and it's told and written with such a delicacy and such a sensitivity to an emotional state, despite a very clear lack of specificity about any kind of detail in which it's set. It is just one person reaching out to another person and essentially saying, hey, I, I'm getting a sense that maybe you're not doing too well and I don't want to overstep and say that I need to, you know, step into your life and and help you because it's not for me to decide. But I'm just saying that you seem as though you might need it. And 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 putting the cards down and saying, hey, let me know if you do. And you know, there's this on the face of it, there's that's such a simple sentiment. And yet underneath all of that, because Jason is as brilliant as a songwriter he is, there's this there's this unspoken you get a you know, on Twitter the other day. I because Jason's great on Twitter. He answers questions all the time, even one of our best posters. And, and he's a great poster and he's just very interactive with people. And one person asked him, you know, is if you insist, is this a story about two people who've been married and who've known each other for a really long time? Or is it a story about two complete strangers? And Jason's response was, that's a great question. <laughs> mm. 
And I don't think it was, I don't think it was like the typical songwriter, like, well, I know the answer to this, but I don't want to tell you because I don't want to influence the way you think. I think Jason himself genuinely doesn't know. I mm. think it is just a song about, you know, it's about passing ships in the night. You know what I mean? It is a song about the need for connection, the song about the need for just feeling as though someone is there, even if you don't want them to be with you, just knowing that, that possible, that, that you could have, that you could, that you could reach out to them if you felt comfortable and about the, the double-sidedness of that as well. You know, the, the, the nervousness, the anxiousness of seeing someone in distress and trying to figure out how to negotiate that as well as the, very mixed you know bag of, of feelings that when you are the one who's in distress and you simultaneously know that you need help but you also can't stand the idea of reaching out to someone there's just so much in this very just pointed moment that the song occupies and jason's ability to capture that to render that and to allow you to fill in a history within your head and 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 f fill in your own life into that interaction is just a, a, a testament to his vast skill and power and that's just one moment on the album that particularly i don't even know why it 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 it, it it's the thing with jason like there's overtly sad songs and there's overtly devastating songs on this record i mean the way in which jason deftly negotiates the difficult topic of uh, gun violence and school shooting specifically on save the world and again very pointedly approaches it from a very personal perspective seeking not to sensationalize the events in any way but just honestly depict how it made him feel you know that that's emotionally raw and devastating but that didn't <laughs> that didn't make me cry on my first listen but if you insisted and it's it, he sneaks up on you Jake, what are your thoughts? And and especially as it pertains to this overarching theme of kind of Jason writing these very intimate stories about the need for connection and about people reaching out. I mean, how has this album been hitting for you? I definitely agree overall with like your broad assessment of like what the album is about. But there is something I feel like that's very key to understanding this is that the title of the album, Weather Veins, once that lyrical idea is dropped on one of the songs here everything about this kind of clicked for me because not only is it about trying to reach out it's about trying to reach out despite the circumstance and the circumstance is that every character on every story on here which all of the songs on here are stories they are characters they are jason building his abilities as a storyteller is that they are all in some way, a weather vane, someone who is pointed in a specific direction because of the wind, somebody who is pointed in a place or towards something despite fate, despite circumstances, despite everything. It's everyone headed in a specific direction. They know they're headed in that direction and they can't really do anything to help that. They're exploring a certain sense of helplessness and they're trying to reach out despite that. And that's always what gets me about the core of all these songs is that they're all like that. The, 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 there is kind of an elusive emotional quality to all of these that makes them difficult to bend down. Like Riley said, like, I think the first song to really like Death Wish, Death Wish definitely grew on me. I really liked that song when it came out, but I, I turned on this album when I got a hold of it and it just, oh, man, that shit hits. I think it might be my favorite song here. And that's, really impressive frankly because while we definitely overall we like love reunions i think it's probably inarguable that reunions in his recent streak of you know southeastern onward records probably the weakest record in that run on the whole i think it definitely contains maybe some I mean, of the would, biggest I mean, highlights i would argue that but yeah whatever okay fair enough but still that's the thing is that that's just how good these records are uh, but Reunions for me was an album that was full of great Jason songs and some of his absolute best, but still on the whole was a little bit imbalanced. Whereas here, 
everything is just rock fucking solid and the album is so long that you just don't anticipate that being the case and you're just like is this going to come at a sacrifice for maybe the sound and it doesn't it actually further advances it one of the coolest things about reunions was how he kind of leaned into that sort of progressive country like you know like the songs on there like my favorite my my second favorite jason isbell song i actually made a top 20 jason isbell songs this week when i was thinking about all of his music my second favorite song of his is only children and you listen to that and it's like the guitar tones on that sound like fucking pink floyd it sounds incredible and then you listen to this album and it's just like the apotheosis of Jason as an artist. This sounds like drive-by truckers where it has that Southern rock kind of grit to it that some of these songs have when they're more filled with momentum. And a lot of that has to do with the performances on here. Jason's always been a great performer, always been the case. But something that he actually clarified this week on Twitter that really clicked for me is that I was just like, man, there's something about the performances on this album that are just to just knock me out consistently. And it's because that unlike before, where he does, you know, isolated vocal tracks and then guitar work, he's doing both at the same time here on this record for the vast majority of it. And I feel like the intensity and the kind of almost live performance feeling of that really grounds this album in a tangible reality that makes it really, really satisfying to listen to and to feel on songs like Death Wish, for instance. But then again, Middle of the Morning is a song that comes along and it's just like, this is the song that made me cry the first time I heard it because this is an this is a song One of the that like- for me too. <laughs> yeah, it, it's just, it's the portrayal of a guy who's clearly like lived a difficult life, probably because of partially the way that he is, but has just had a rough time of it really and it's just maybe a, a particularly antagonistic type of person and he's just getting used to the simple domesticity of life and just learning to appreciate it and struggling with it not being able to fully embrace it but still just trying to to, to see what he's been missing out on this whole time and it, it's so well captured it's it's such a specific feeling and he gets it effortlessly and that's basically the modus operandi for basically everything on here i mean uh, save the world <laughs> is fucking staggering dude like the second you just hear that opening little guitar i feel like boom 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 and then you get to it and then like this is one of the best sounding jason isbell songs the the moment where he starts talking about the instance where i i'm pretty sure that this is inspired by the shooting that happened in Texas last year. He specifically refers to when you said the, the cops just let them die. And then he comes out with that fucking hook on this song. And every time I hear it, I'm just like, swear you'll save the world when I lose my grip. It's, it's so fucking good. Just the idea of being so helpless on this song. And you just need someone else to depend on because this isn't about dealing with the trauma of like living in the wake of these things. It is partially in about how it affects Jason in the moment and what it affects him in like, you know, when he's just in the grocery store and he's just thinking about yeah. his kids starting school. That's the thing. It's like, it's not about being in the wake of tragedy. It's about this kind of sense of constant heightened tension that tension, no resolution to any of these ugly things. You just constantly live in, am in amongst them. Yes. And man, we've been on about this because we've talked about Jason recently. I talked about Jason Isbell in my little uh, country albums video that you need to listen to. We talked about Southeastern recently. And in one thing that we have kept saying that we haven't really gotten the chance to fully ride home, I guess, is Sadler Vaden. Motherfuckers guitar on this album. I need on every song, all of them is extraordinary. I mean, this is pornographic. The way that they're mixed, it is so crisp. It is so beautiful. And on songs like Save the World, it is titanic. On songs like The Closer, this is the most essential the 400 unit have sounded to Jason. Like, because before, like in albums that I love, like the Nashville Sound, for instance, that's a band that, or that's an album that totally benefits from having the 400 unit there. But it still feels like they're very much serving the song. You know, they're, they're all part and parcel of the overall experience. Whereas Jason still kind of feels like he's the main draw. 
Here, on the other hand, it just feels like every part of this album and every musician is as essential as everyone else. Like, the fucking woodblock percussion on a song like Death Wish at the very end, you're just like, the, who the, even fucking thought of this? Like, that's genius. The congas genius. on this, is, this Ain't It as well are such a, like, bowler decision, just to chuck those in there. Dude. One thing that's interesting, just after watching Running With Our Eyes Closed, is that provided a really interesting insight into Jason's compositional process on that album which is that he came into the studio the songs he'd done the songs he wrote the song the mm -hmm. song was ready he came in he played the song on acoustic to the band and they was and they were like we're going and recording it and and that was it and i don't know what happened behind the scenes of this album but it feels very much like it was a more a, a deliberately more collaborative process creating these songs and it really shows as well. I totally echo what you're saying about Sadler. I'm going to shout out Derry de Borja because I think that low key, a lot of the shit that he's doing is just incredible. Particularly again, the um, yep. the organ contributions. I think it's if you insist that has the organ that makes me fucking weep on it. Uh, his, oh my god, man! His regular synthesizer key and key contributions are amazing as well. Like just the whole band are just it's larger than life these songs especially the bigger moments on the record as well songs like when we were close and king of oklahoma as well when oh. and of course the, the the twin epics at the at the final stretch as well just the sense of scale here that's happening on multiple levels beyond just jason's writing because as, as great as the albums his albums are musically we're always primarily talking about the writing and here we are too but like there's yeah it's just it's not for lack of like other really invigorating stuff demanding your attention and and jason is just shepherding and corralling and just completely you know went through his you know overarching role as producer as well as composer you know really placing everyone within this in a, in a really essential way in a really vital and muscular way uh which just is it, it, it's so satisfying man when we were close is like as for it's basically Jason writing, you know, country music, a star is born with as much tragedy as that implies that and the lyrical sucker punch, I dare not spoil. But like the, the idea of just like connections being in the past and defining you all the way up until your present and eventually future self is also just a theme that's basically all over here. Uh, also, another fantastic sort of like deep cut here to me is uh, a song that this one this one really gets me uh which is volunteer uh just the story about this person who you know is is passed around in like foster homes and stuff has a really difficult upbringing which is a subject that is uh close to my heart so it's already kind of mm, it's 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 we're in some sketchy territory and then there is a lyric on here where he talks about from the character's perspective about dreaming about his mother's ghosts holding him tight and i was just like oh god oh, oh i'm gonna i'm gonna lose it in this fucking whole foods i'm gonna die it's th there are so many moments where he just the, i i call them achilles heel moments where it's just like the whole song is built around this emotional crux and then eventually he'll just get to that one lyric that one idea that'll just Come out from a bolt in the blue and you will just be on your fucking knees if you feel this album the way that it's meant to be felt. That's on, I mean, most tangibly, I think a song that is maybe wholly comprised of these moments is Cast Iron Skillet, which yeah, is I was gonna... the song of this album, I think. Cast Iron Skillet is a great, like, uh, it's a centerpiece, like deliberately. It's like right at the center of the album. And it kind of works if you split the album in two halves, it kind of works as the finale to the first half. And, you know, it's a perfect example of a classic Isbell song. And what's interesting about this album, and this is just, I guess, more sideways, but whatever, is that like every Isbell album has like, you know, obvious classic Isbell songs on it. But this is maybe the first one for me anyway, since Southeastern, where it's like, there's, you know, there's, sure, there's classic Isbell songs. I mean, King of Oklahoma and Cast Iron Skillet are probably the most obvious contenders. But there's, this is the first album since Southeastern where, and maybe even more so than Southeastern, where I don't really think this album has standouts, like, at all. Uh -huh. Like, it just... Yeah, you're right! Standout <laughs> implies a, a, a sense of, like, variation i'm not even talking about in quality but just like in terms of like things that leap out that this album just doesn't really have but 
cast iron skillet is the most jason isbell core song on this album because it is fundamentally a song about reckoning with the difference between how you are as a person how you have advanced how you have like made the decision to kind of progress and step forward and move along with the world and your life and not be attached to the past at all cost and how you view the past how you view the place that you came from you know and it works in tandem with volunteer in a similar way which has this kind of overarching theme of, of distance and alienation and and unhappy memories of home and so jason's great at kind of kind of commentating on ideas that are fairly modern that are fairly progressive for country music without ever making it feel as though he's like doing a you know a, a, a topic song or doing a kind of like this is the political song, song. like you know yeah, I mean? none of that and part of it, I think, comes from how personal the approach is, especially with the first half of Cast Iron Skillet being such a personal story of growing up and knowing someone at school who eventually would go on to murder someone and, and kind of reconciling that and dealing with that and, and growing up. And then when that person um, passes away, like, how do you, what are the emotions that you feel in that? And then, of course, it gets even more personal with, um, with when we were close, which is specifically about someone dying who you were very close to, but then who you fell out with. And what are the emotions entangled within that grief that are more complicated and difficult to deal with? But but cast iron skillet, like just the the emotional difficulty and rawness of this song, both in terms of 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 in these two specific stories that are a, 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 an outfit for the narrator of the song to reflect on how distanced they are now from the place and the people where they grew up and how they psychologically deal with that when a, a core part of who they were, a core part of what, you know, of the place and the people that kind of made him feel so distant now and feel so foreign now and feel so wrong now. And, and just capturing that in the narrative of processing someone who you once knew killing someone and then dealing with their death and of, and the narrative in the second half of the song as well of the regressive sort of and persistent sort of stereotypes of racism and, and mixed race relationships as well that endure in culture. Like just again, Jason makes it work because it's never about the topic. It is about the emotion that he feels overseeing that like how he feels looking at this regressive old man who rejects his daughter for her mixed race relationship how does he feel looking on that how does that make him feel and he always front loads that personal connection and that personal view and that stops it from being a topical song and, and makes it a jason isbell from the heart song you know and again he's able to do that while still making songs that are narrative songs that are ostensibly fictional even if they sometimes integrate autobiographical elements it's 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 just what jason does it's it's that fucking it's that ambiguity it's that it, it all comes back to the title the cast iron skillet the refrain of the song is don't wash the cast iron skillet and that's the thing is that the way he creates a distance lyrically from how you feel and how you've progressed as a person and the things that are drilled into you from youth is through these lyrical refrains, through these stanzas of just like washing a cast iron skillet. That's just like a Southern saying. Like that's just something that like lots of older families will say not to do, even though it's not necessarily true. Like, you know, you can wash a cast iron skillet. It's just sort of like a, a piece of Southern wisdom or, or I mean, like basically like an old wives tale thing. It captures this really definitive feeling for me when you grow up in the south there and you grow up to be a very different kind of person that maybe you were raised to be you feel really paradoxical when you get older because there's a sense of distance you feel but there's also a connection to your roots that feels like you want to tap into that you feel nostalgic for it and you know it's part of who you are but at the same time you still kind of resent that because you know that it comes with a lot of toxicity and lots of you know fundamental beliefs that you don't necessarily share and that you feel distance from but the, the reckoning with both of these things is a lot more complicated than it initially sounds and that's exactly what this song 
is about and it does that by just being like it, it, it he never tells you how to feel or the the validity of these statements or lack thereof of the validity of these statements it's always just about this wisdom that's imparted to you and what you choose to do with or not do with it mm -hmm. and that's why it's just such a compelling story overall that's that that sort of sense of being up in the air and being left to feel about like what these songs even are is present in stuff like King of Oklahoma, for instance, um, Middle of the Morning 2, Cast Iron Skillet, Volunteer, Vestavia Hills. It's so Jason, but at the same time, it's so timeless. It just feels like this album exists in a, it, it exists to me in the same place that you know Springsteen's Nebraska does, where it feels like these stories are just immortal and channeled through a voice. I think it's kind of a little bit like, and this is not a perfect one-to-one, -one, but it's kind of a little bit like um, Isabel's The River, if we're going to make a, a Springsteen comparison. Yeah, 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 yeah. I like like they're both long air albums for those artists, but that they capture the sprawl that represents the complicated reality of of, of the, your attachment to the place that you're from and your connect, the connections that you have and how you move forward as you're like approaching this point in your life that's like a clear point of no return. And obviously Isbell was older than Springsteen when he recorded this album versus that one, but there is a little bit of a thread there. Yeah. And the, the, the thing, the, the thing that really gets me about cast iron skillet, like that, that core idea of like, it's not easy to reject things that have been drilled into you your entire life, no matter how plainly absurd they might seem through the light of day. Now it's just not as easy as you might. Think you don't know. You, like you're just gonna think that you can walk you you can or can't wash that cast iron skillet for 40 years because nobody tells you otherwise exactly one song that i want to talk about that hasn't been mentioned yet it's another one of the four that made me cry in fact i'll just say what the four were uh they're middle of the morning if you insist cast iron skillet and white beretta which amazing is, song which is a song uh, again, there's one of the more, one of the closest to autobiographical from all I can tell on this album. There's obviously a lot of fictionalization where Jason is reflecting on a time when he was young and he got a girl pregnant and convinced her to have an abortion and was essentially terrified the whole time, acting very much out of self-protection and a lack of understanding and certainly a not, not having a clear picture of what this girlfriend was going through and it is jason revisiting that experience reckoning with the kind of callous person and scared admittedly like it was acting selfishly but through a place of fear and anxiety but that led him to act in a way that just that he deeply regrets essentially and that's the kind of text and then there's the subtext of the reality of what it was like then and what it, the difficulties that continue to endure in terms of the accessibility of of abortion care and of the experience of having an abortion which is regardless of the context often a source of great trauma for women and often a situation in which there's what could loosely be termed an inadequate level of support and Jason, again, this could be a very difficult topic for Jason, a man, to approach, but he wisely keeps it personal and he wisely keeps it not about, you know, the specifics of the abortion or anything like that, or of, or even of the woman's experience, but just of, on what he is able to glean about his own behavior retrospectively and essentially explicitly making an apology for that behavior. And it's both deeply evocative of this clearly distant but also like very viscerally memorable experience for him like the way that he fixates on the minutiae of that experience of the car of listening to Sunvolt on the radio of these little things that he was clinging to at the time to keep him tethered as he was lost in his own head and this experience and then just this ultimate sort of empathic apology and admission and the part that really got me is the, uh, I thank God you weren't brought up like me with all that shame and certainty, and I'm sorry you had to go in that room alone, which is hard for me to Ugh. even say out loud. I'm keeping it together. I'm smiling so I don't die. This is 
what makes Jason one of our great mm. songwriters is his ability to create such a visceral experience of that within you while also being cognizant of the fact that the experience you're having is one particular side of a story that is, you know, retrospectively being viewed through a new lens by someone who sees the error of their ways, you know, long after it's too late, but still attempts to make good. And, and that, 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 the, the, that's the core of Jason's humanity and his ability to be truthful and be honest and it's not about how autobiographical it is. It's not about, you know, I may be wrong. Maybe this didn't specifically happen to Jason in this way. I'm just sort of t gathering what I can through interview statements. He's good enough of a storyteller that you can't tell. Like, but, um, <laughs> but, but there, there, there is a truthfulness to it that, that makes it so unbearably difficult to experience. Um, yeah, I the mean, only one of these that I know for certain is autobiographical as that it actually is when we were close because i know that song is about uh justin towns earl who mm -hmm. is a, a singer songwriter who passed away in 2020 and you know that that song is ostensibly about a kind of survivor's guilt mm -hmm. because earl never got sober and ultimately that's what claimed his life it's sort of just like i i, I couldn't save you and it wasn't my responsibility to save you, but I still feel like I should have done something, even though we weren't even close anymore. Yeah. And I, I mean, again, it's, you know, I don't have all the answers. You don't have the answers, Sway. Um, that was inappropriate. I'm sorry. This album is so gift wrapped to be somebody's amazing introduction to Jason's music I couldn't name a better way to get into an artist frankly the the singer songwriter tendencies of his sound his storytelling this is so universally appealing without sacrificing the personability of it like Jesus Christ, if you haven't heard this album, please go out of your way to do so it's not like Jason's unsuccessful or anything but like it's safe to say that however much we praise any given album on this show, this is going to be an album this year that is ripe for being the album that we like the most, that the least amount of people will hear. Yeah. And that is stupid. I, I think, I think from what I've seen online, I think there's elements of this record that are resonating more with people. And I think it's well positioned to be a good entry point into Jason, because again, is he has this great ability of, integrating little elements that feel very current and feel very of the moment but are a part of a fabric such that they don't become topic songs we've already talked about how how beautifully he does that with save the world but also king of oklahoma as well which at its core is a song about the opioid e epidemic basically yep. and yep. It, you don't necessarily even you get blindsided by that because it's so narrative driven and you're so embedded in a story that is told you're like oh it's about that yeah yeah, exactly. And you read, and you, you, you know, it's not like Jason's not hiding that. You, you'll cotton on to it. When no. You do it. But you were involved emotionally with the story before that hits, right? You're involved emotionally with the story because you're involved emotionally in what this character is experiencing and the regrets that he has and the frayed relationships that he's detailing and the gradual alienation and distancing from the people in his life that he is going through. And it is one of Jason's most masterfully constructed story songs in the sense that it is a narrative. From, from start to finish and uh just it, it completely blindsided me coming off the back of death wish which again incredible opener as well i mean you get a real sense of what kind of this al album this is and the kind of immediacy this album is going to have emotionally by the fact that it opens up with the lines did you ever love a woman with a death wish something in her eyes like flipping off a light switch like that was that's really striking like immediately you know okay, we're going to be going to some difficult emotional places and we're going to be telling some unpleasant stories that are not going to have happy endings necessarily all of the time. And I appreciate how, and I think that the way that Jason front loads that, the way that Jason immediately hits you with that is going to get a lot of people really invested in this record when they put it on. And it is just one of those great, well-constructed, luxurious albums where each song is, is, a, is a new story, is a new wrinkle into the narrative, is a new kind of side of Jason 
and so there's going to be ones that hit you immediately like death wish like king of oklahoma like save the world like cast iron skillet like white burrito those are very immediate bowl you over songs but the the true genius and the greatness of this album is the way in which the more intimate tiny seemingly insignificant moments as you really let them seep in and as you pay attention to the way that Jason writes them and the way that the story unfolds, you recognize that Jason is equally brilliant at these tiny little moments between two people as he is at the, as the more sweeping reflections on, you know, your relationship with your hometown and grief and the way you change as you age. I've already talked about If You Insist, which, you know, honestly might be my favorite song on the album, but Strawberry Woman equally as one of these songs oh. as well the, the 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 visual storytelling through the writing of this is just that's a fucking perfect. scene with that jason, one it's jason through and through as well you know the 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 sly commentary the the seating of the scene in the laundromat and then the the the, the guy in the cowboy hat with the square toed boots and just the 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 feeling of a memory being recalled and laid out in front of you, the the vividness of the metaphor of of this woman being thick cut bacon on Texas toast, and you know the the way in which those little uh pre those little details of environment are mixed in with specific uh, evocations of a memory. You know, a Friday night two hours ago. I don't even know if I understand the song. I don't know if the song is there to be understood, like in the same way that King of Oklahoma is. But again, I just, I'm a sucker for these songs where you get, you're hinted at a sense of a history and of an unspoken shared reality between two people that you're privy to these flashes of, but you have to fill in those gaps. And you're just given these flashes, these moments, these images that, allow you to complete the scene in your head and strawberry woman's beautiful example of, of the way that jason does that so many images of the of scenes between these two people like i remember you when the bar was closed dancing on the table with a bloody nose and you still look fine you still look free that's all the context you you're given with that particular memory and you just cumulatively all of these fragments with across the song add up to this portrait of two people who you come to realize as to the song progresses discovered this connection shared this environment and then the nature of that relationship changed in some way and that's that's it but you you come to understand that through indirect means you know and this is simplicity of of strawberry woman the strawberry woman refrain changing each time that it's iterated i'm not even building up a thesis here i'm just fucking gawping at jason's skill and ability and his understanding of how to give you enough information to put you into a world and allow you to complete that. It's yeah. what makes talking about this so difficult is that it's just it, without going into why every level of this is fundamentally outstanding, we would just turn into a video essay of ourselves. And the, the only thing that I want to touch on is just how staggering the closer miles is. Because it frames itself, I mean, first of all, it's notable that this is a long song, but it 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 frames itself with those one of like those very personal, tightly contained stories about uh, specifically in reference to uh, a, a comparison with Disneyland that uh, hits particularly hard once you get the macro view of the song. But like it's the bridge here where Jason essentially makes this song into a kind of tableau for what he perceives to be the sins of his generation. He's talking about all the things that they do. The In the name of survival, we get used to this. In the name of forgiveness, we get bored. For entertainment, we ball up our fists, take it out on the kid at the grocery store. In the name of desire, we burn everything. In the name of redemption, we buy it back. Like, this entire segment of this song here is so fucking, like, timeless sounding this is i mean i could only call it like dylan-esque it's so fucking beautiful in the way that it manages to wrap all of these stories into one thing of just like and this is what we've ignored this is what we've put off and in, in, in the name of all of these things and in the pursuit of all of this it's just fuck me man jesus and, and that little part of, and that part of the song is like is the is stuck in between this framing narrative 
of the the changing relationship between a father and daughter, which beautifully echoes the closing track on Reunions, which is also about the relationship with the father and daughter, but how he perceives it as he projects forward into the future. And here it's, it is the future. The, the girl is grown up and it's this, ah! And he's, and, and the, <laughs> the Disneyland detail, the context for where that comes from, and then how it's reincorporated at the end. And I'm not even talking about the fact that the fucking, before I even read that Isabel said this song was basically to him, like it's Neil Young doing Wings. I already thought this was McCartney. <laughs> and then the, 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 the construction of it. And that just completely. That's fantastic. Fuck. Morgan, I feel like we've just, just stolen all the material here. I want to. I wanna... No, I mean, I just got... want to thank you all for doing my job for me. I don't even have to say shit. And... I mean, it must be satisfying on some level just because, you know, without you, I would not be a Jason Isbell fan. Uh, like, I, I feel like we wouldn't be as into him as we would without you, without your, your passion for his records, frankly. And I mean, like, hell, Something More Than Free is the best album I've listened to this year still. It, it is. It remains dethroned. This, this, for all intents and purposes, hell, he's going to be in a Martin Scorsese movie this year. This is the year of Isbell, motherfucker. We won. Um, we did! Poor transition, but I just thought of another thread I want to pick up on, which is uh, something you've kind of already alluded to, Jake, which is the sense with which this album sort of nods back to drive by truckers in some respect. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sort of in the approach to certain songs. You know, Jason did a great interview with um Stephen Hyden of Oprox, where mm-hmm. he kind of where Hyden, who clued into this, deliberately asked him about it. And and Isabel said, you know, in direct reference to songs like Cast Iron Skillet and King of o- Oklahoma, that he called those songs the old assignment, which yeah. by by which he meant they were songs where he was kind of deliberately revisiting the sort of space and compositional style that he approached when he was in the truckers as a, you know, as a part of the process of, I guess, you know, a lot of these songs are sort of about looking backwards and reflecting and echoing some of that musically with certain moments of this record was a part of his process of doing that. And so so this looking back and kind of echoing certain elements of, of truckers in the, in the more sort of, I guess, blossoming musical style of this, like in those songs, is complemented beautifully by Vestavia Hills, which is almost like a meta song mm. for me in a certain sense, because this is a song about, from the perspective of a roadie, essentially, or like a, of a crew guy um, who's who's traveling with a band, essentially, who's essentially, or no, with a solo artist, I think, in the context of the song, who recognizes that this artist is behaving in a self-destructive fashion, is unraveling, essentially, is going to living the rock and roll lifestyle, and is becoming less and less aware of its consequences on the people around him and i love that this song is from the perspective of the fucking roadie and i love that this is from an outsider scout's perspective because it in a meta way and again you only really read it through this if you know about jason's history but in a meta way it is kind of a way of him sort of commenting on and looking back and reflecting on the kind of person he was becoming with the truckers as his alcoholism became more and more of an impediment to his creative process and to the functionality of that band leading up into the time where he was dismissed from it. So Vestavia Hills coming after these other songs, which musically and in subject matter echo some of the things that might remind you of Drive By Truckers, the album actually comes around to you know, in an oblique way, but in a de- definitely tangible way, actually commenting on Jason at that time and taking a sideways glance, again, looking back, reflecting much like it's it's kind of it's right next to White Beretta as well, which is another song about reflecting on how you used to be different in a way that you regret. And, you know, these two songs back to back, you know, looking back on an earlier stage in life again, not presuming the extent to which either of them are actually autobiographical, but still looking back on a previous stage in your life thinking, shit, I really fucked up. And how must that have looked from the people around me who were just trying to help me, who were a part of this with me? How must my behavior have looked to that poor girl that I got pregnant who had to have that abortion? How must my behavior have looked to the roadies and the bandmates who had to deal with that? You know, again, storytelling fictional realm wise, but just generally you can extrapolate. And, and that, angle coming more into focus in the back half of the album is such a nice thorn in it and such a nice like oh god i 
the more I think about this album, the more I talk myself through it, the more I'm just, just <laughs> the more I'm in love with it. Like I cannot wait to spend the rest of my life with this album. <laughs> Um, yes, oh. let's do our favorite tracks and ratings for Weather Vanes by Jason Isbell on the 400 unit. Jake, why don't you go first? I'm just going to read off the songs from this album that made it into my top 20 Jason Isbell songs. Um, we've got Death Wish, Cast Iron Skillet, Save the World, Middle of the Morning, and When We Were Close, all in the top 20, uh, which is very impressive. 9.5 out of 10 top five of the year baby uh and maybe even like i i think maybe overall right now my third favorite of jason's albums which is difficult three favorites uh, yes 10 my three favorites are the line where he, he says, she found love and it was simple as a weather vane and I throw up on my shoes. She <laughs> found love in a hopeless place. <sighs> hey, that's a great song too. I'm just, I'm just riffing. Um, no, I think we were, I, th I think he threw up at the riff. If I had to pick three, if you insist in cast iron skillet, uh, the, the, the two for me. Uh, and if I had to pick a third, I don't fucking know, man. Uh, White Beretta, I suppose. Look, I love this album to bits. Um, I've been kind of like sort of mentally sort of saying to myself, let it sit with you before you, you know, throw up your rating, you know, in terms of the higher echelons. But it's one of those things we're talking it through. Just it, it's obvious. This is a nine out of 10 for me. Uh, it's easily one of the top five albums of the year for me. I mean, it's which means that the average overall for Jason Isbell on the 400 units weather veins is 9.5. Let us know what you think of either of the albums we've discussed today. Janelle Monet's The Age of Not Innocence. Janelle Monet's The Age of <laughs> Definitely Not. <laughs> and Jason Isbell in the 400 units. We the veins, let us know if you agree with us, if you disagree, where you land, what connections you forge with these albums, if any at all, in the comments below. Love hearing your perspectives. Love hearing what you think of the job that we do as well, because we're doing, we are trying our best. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a like and subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. Both those things help us out an enormous deal, as do your comments, which are eternally, we're eternally grateful for. If you want to go above and beyond and support us directly for just $1 a month, you can become a member of the Jams D family, get your name and the title call of every video on this channel plus if you want to recommend us some music to talk about in our now episodes your recommendation will go to the top of the pile which essentially means we will do it we'll fucking do it uh, do, do it again. again fuck i do need some though folks rock over london rock on chicago rice krispies snap crackle pop